14, and we're just going to uh, read again two verses, uh, verses 26 and verse 33. Luke chapter 14, and the verse 26, and the verse 33. When you have it, say amen. If anyone comes to me, Jesus speaking, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Verse 33 says, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. The CEV says it like this, You cannot be my disciple unless you love me more then you love your father and mother, your wife and children, your brothers and sisters. You cannot follow me unless you love me more than your own life. In the same way, none of you can be my disciples unless you give up everything. Amen, somebody. You see, we need to understand that in order for us to truly follow the Lord, you and I must be willing to spiritually surrender all, even our own lives, to God. But the question is, why does God require our spiritual surrender? The answer to that is simple. As his bond slaves, amen, somebody. God demands our absolute obedience, our absolute humility, and our absolute loyalty. We must continually work towards building our love for God in order that we may never love, honor, and treasure creation more than the creator. Which is why I would like to call your attention this morning to one of the greatest examples in scripture of spiritual surrender. I want you to go with me to the book of Genesis chapter 22, a familiar passage, one that we've covered before, but I want us to look at it today in a different sense. Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. And I pray that we're all ready to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. You have Genesis 22 starting with verse 1. Say amen. The word of God says, now it came to pass after these things that God tested. Is that what your Bible says? That God tested, put to the test, Abraham. Remember, as we pointed out this morning in Sunday school, the Godhead wills that your and my faith be tested, tried, and proven. Is that all right? Sometimes when we're being tested, we, we have a notion that it's uh, not something that God means, but God means to test us. Is that all right? And he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son. Is that all right? For you God here, people, that means yakit. Your absolute only son. Amen, somebody. 
You say, well, didn't he have another son, Ishmael? Yes, he had another son, Ishmael, but that wasn't the promised son. That wasn't the son that God told him that he would have. Amen, somebody. So he says, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, the son of promise. Watch this. Whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. You need to understand that what God is truly asking Abraham here is he's asking for Abraham's spiritual surrender and giving back to God the great gift, his son Isaac, which God had first given to him. Even at a time when he and his wife were considered dead as far as conceiving a child. Amen, somebody. You see, it's critical for you and I to ask ourselves, is there anything that God has blessed us to receive that we're not willing to freely give back to him? How do you look at what you've been blessed to receive? Notice I said blessed to receive. Because in John chapter 3 and verse 27, John the baptizer said, a man can receive nothing unless it had been given to him from heaven. James chapter 1 and verse 17 says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And then... Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, makes it clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7 when he said, what is so special about you? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if everything you have is from God, why do you brag as though it were not a gift? Some of us are walking and high signing like everything we got, we are the ones responsible for it. You see, the point is this. We must be careful as to what, who, and how much we cherish and treasure the things of this life. And the degree, watch this, and the degree to which we may even love them. Y'all ain't hearing this. As we must not allow ourselves to have more love for the things in which God has given us than him who has given us all things. You say, well, why is that so important? Because Jesus himself said, our Lord said in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Is that all right? So we, we can't receive from God and not be willing to freely give back what he's given us. And guess what that includes? Your life. Notice then Abraham's attitude towards God's commands. God asked him to give back the great gift of his son. Amen, somebody. Notice Abraham's attitude. Notice his faith to do God's will. Notice he didn't act like me and you. He didn't ask God, well, why? What for? Amen, somebody. Is that all right? When God commands us to do something, you just do it. Verses 3 and 4 says, so Abraham rose early. Y'all ain't getting that. In the morning, and saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went, and arose and went, and arose and went. Lord, you're asking me to do something difficult. And arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. 
I, I need to uh, help you and me to understand this early. This early is a scriptural term that is often associated with God's people. And it, it really uh, speaks to the fact that uh, the manner in which God's people rose up to do his will, they did it early. Amen, somebody. You say, well, I'm not an early person. Well, make sure you get up to do God's will no matter what time you get up. If God bless you to wake up, you should get up to do his will. Is that all right? But specifically, this word is used to demonstrate the determination of the individual to rise up daily, specifically for the purpose of doing exactly what the Lord commanded. I wonder how many of us wake up determined to do what God said. Watch this. I'm going to borrow an illustration from Brother Chuck from our first Peter class on last Saturday when he said that we can wake up determined, devoted to God not to sin for the day. We can wake up in devotion to God to plan that I am not going to sin today. And guess what? If we love the Lord, we can carry it out. Are we getting this? Notice then verse 5, because this is crucial. We're talking about a faith that is willing to surrender all unto God. Verse 5 says, and Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Are y'all getting this? God told him to go and sacrifice his son. Look at his faith. He tells the young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. Notice what he calls it. He calls it worship. We will go and worship, but we will come back to you. Not just me, we. Y'all ain't getting this. Y'all need to wake up this morning. You need to know that God has been good to you. We will come back to you. Faith, confident assurance that he had in order to even make this statement to these young men. Well, the question is, why could he be so confident? How could he be so assured that they were going to come back? We have to remember the promise. Amen, somebody. Do you know the promises of God? Maybe that's why we don't have faith, because we don't know what God promised. Amen. Remember the promise. Amen. Go back with me to Genesis chapter 12, all right? Genesis chapter 12, but then we're going to go to Genesis 15. First, Genesis chapter 12, as we hasten. Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 4. Amen. Genesis chapter 12. Starting with verse number one. If you have it, say amen. The Lord said, had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. Is that what he said? Leave. 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 Leave some things that are fond, that you are fond of. Leave some things that are closely associated with you. You see, sometimes in order for us to do God's will, to fulfill God's purpose in our lives, sometimes we need to get away from some familiar associations. That sometimes it's people in your life that will hold you back from doing what God will have you to do. And because we love them so much, we will be around them anyway. And they're, they're continuing to impede upon and hinder our purpose, our work for, for God. 
So God tells him, get away. Leave. Is that all right? But do you, do you and I have the faith to leave? Amen, somebody. Verse 2, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you will be a blessing to others. See, it's not about us just being blessed for us. It's about us be, being blessed by God to be a blessing to somebody else. Is that all right? I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. Watch this. Here's the promise. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. 75. He could have said, nah, man, I'm old and I'm setting my ways. I, I done built this. I done built this house. I done, I done, I, no, this is my life. I ain't leaving. But he had the faith to go when God said go. Is that all right? Now look with me in Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15 and the verses 1 through 6. You remember this because this is after Abraham rescued Lot. And then he met a man named Melchizedek. Is that all right? And he gave him a tenth part. No, we're not talking about that. Amen, somebody. Is that all right? But Lot, watch what he says. Genesis chapter 15, starting with verse 1, says later... The Lord spoke to Abram in a vision. Abram, do, do not be afraid. I will protect you and reward you greatly. But Abram answered, Lord, all powerful, you have given me everything I could ask for except for children. Y'all hear this? And when I die, Eliezer of Damascus will get all I own. You have not given me any children, and this servant of mine will inherit everything. This is his thinking. I don't have a seed, God. You give me everything, but I don't have a seed. Verse 4, the Lord replied, no, he won't. You will have a son of your own, and everything you have will be his. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said, look at the sky and see if you can count the stars. That's how many descendants you will have. Notice verse 6. And Abram believed the Lord. He believed the Lord. He trusted him. He relied on. He had confidence in the Lord. As we talked this morning, it's one thing to believe in God because many people believe in God. Many people. We can go down the street right now. Do you believe in Yeah, I believe in God. You may believe in God, but do you believe God? There's a difference. Most people believe in God, but they don't believe God enough to obey him. Amen, somebody. Abraham believed. He believed what God said, that he would have a son of his own, which takes us back to Genesis 22. You see, just as with Abraham, our faith, our faith, our complete trust, our complete reliance, confidence, and assurance, and steadfastness in God must grow as we journey together with God. Guess what? Your faith can't be the same level as it was when you got out of this baptism. It has to grow. It has to grow to trust God. Amen, somebody. And it's through our experience with the Lord, our experiential knowledge. Because guess what? Many of us sitting here today have mental knowledge of God, but not experiential knowledge to where we actually trust God enough to do what he said. 
We want to impress people with mental knowledge, but impress people with your applied knowledge. Live it. Don't just tell your children about God. Live it. Listen. Experiences with the Lord. It's through our experiences with the Lord that we learn, watch this, that we learn that God is faithful to his promises. That God is faithful. There's things that you and I have been through that we had no way, we had no hope. We didn't know how we was going to get out of this. And God got us through. Faithful. He's faithful even when I'm not. Amen, somebody. Have you messed up in your life before? Have you messed up in your life before? Amen, somebody. And God is still good to you. Not because of who you are, because of who he is. You see, that demonstration allows us then to grow more faithful in being able to surrender all to him. Even those things which are most dear and most difficult for us to let go. Amen, somebody. Because we all want to have a sense of control in our lives. We hate and we fear being vulnerable. We fear being exposed. We fear being hurt. And God is saying to us, you can't continue to have that mindset and serve me. I'm going to have to allow you to go through situations that are completely out of your control. So that you can learn to trust in me. Is that all right? Letting go and letting God have his way in your life. That's the most difficult thing in this journey of being a Christian. Letting go and letting God have his way. Is that all right? Notice then as we hasten, verses 6 and 7. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. Wait a minute. I thought Isaac was just a little boy. Amen, somebody. If he was just a little boy, if he was just like Scott and, 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 and Josh, he wouldn't have no back, no wood on his back carrying up some mountain. Amen, somebody. Y'all y'all getting this? And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. Are y'all getting this? He laid the wood on his back and the two of them went together. You see, here lies a, a double fulfillment because some years later, another father would lay some wood upon the back of his only begotten son. Some years later, another father will lay wood upon the back of his only begotten son on another mountain called Calvary in this same region. And he would go up on Calvary together with his son in order to sacrifice him. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. You can just imagine the heartache of Abraham. Here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood. But where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Man, somebody. Y'all ain't getting this. We got the fire, we got the wood that. 
But where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? About that time, if I was Isaac, I would have been walking away. Where's the lamb? Amen, somebody. And you know, he was, he was old. He couldn't catch him. Amen, somebody. This is about Isaac's faith, too. Don't miss this. Verse 8 says, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. We're going to make a sacrifice, but we ain't got no lamb, but we still going. Church, we can't see it, but we still need to go. Is that all right? You see, when he says, God will provide, in the Hebrew, this actually means God sees for himself a lamb. God sees for himself. Abraham is saying, I can't see how God is going to provide here, but he sees. Amen, somebody. Verse 9 through 12 says, then they came to the place of which God had told them, told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. Now that's another sermon right there. He placed it in order. Amen, somebody. He did things accordingly to how God had instructed. He bound Isaac. He bound Isaac, his son. He bound Isaac. He bound Isaac. He didn't choke him out, then bind him. Isaac got on that altar willingly. Just like years later, another father's son got on the cross willingly. Laid him upon the altar, upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. But, but, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. We need to know that when we read scripture, we need to pay attention to the context. An angel from heaven. Amen, somebody. An angel from heaven. And he said, do not lay your hand upon the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. I know since you have not withheld your son, your only son, notice, from me. What kind of angel would say this? Angels are created beings. They can receive no worship. Amen, somebody. But in the Old Testament, you see the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, and you have to pay attention to the context because when the angel of the Lord accepts worship, it's talking about the second person of the Godhead. It's talking about Jesus. Now I know, but we need to, need to understand that. Now I know. Understand that God is omniscient. He already knew. So you say, well, what's the proven for then? What is he saying now I know? The proven is for Abraham and Isaac. It's for their sake. So in actuality, he's not saying now I know that you fear God. He's saying now you know. Now you know, now you have learned that you truly fear God. And many times you and I go through things in life and we don't think that we can make it and God gives us 
his strength and his might and his power to get through so that we know that we truly fear God. You didn't think you would make another day, but you got through. You see, here's the point. While you and I don't knew, truly know how the outcome of the things will come to pass that we are nav navigating through in this life, just like Abraham, we come to see and know and love and trust that the Lord sees what we can't see and that God will provide. And that it's just our duty and responsibility to obediently walk by faith and not by sight. No matter what we see, no matter how things may look, amen somebody, by faith we have to trust that God sees what we can't see. Is that all right? And to close, there is something most interesting about this story. Abraham could not see the ram in a bush. And you and I don't see the ram in a bush. Amen, somebody. I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Because, as we'll point out this afternoon, this is something that Abraham never experienced before. Amen, somebody. And God still expects us to trust him, to have faith, to have obedient action, even in things and circumstances and situations of life that we've never seen before. Amen, somebody. We've never seen this pandemic before, but God still expects us to be faithful. He still expects us to be faithful. You see, the Jews who converted to Christianity, they were in it for the first time. They, they've never seen nothing like this before. And the Hebrew writer is writing to them to encourage them, especially in chapter 11, he gives them a whole list of people who by faith stayed faithful to God in something they'd never seen before. Something they never had a, a precedent for or, or an example of. Amen, somebody. Are we getting this? Hebrews chapter 11. If you're there, say amen. We're going to start with verse number 17. Notice this. Notice what Abraham was thinking. Remember, he didn't see the lamp ram in a bush. So what was his thinking? All right? He didn't know exactly how God would provide, but he trusted that he would. Verse 17 says, by faith, amen, somebody, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. In other words, he did what God commanded. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Is that what your Bible says? Of whom it was said in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Is that all right? Notice verse 19. Here is what Abraham was thinking. Concluding, concluding, concluding. In other words, he offered up his son because he concluded. Concluded what? That God was able to raise him up even from the dead from which also received him in a figurative sense. You see, God tested Abraham in two ways. Number one, in overcoming the natural love for his son. And number two, in obeying even when he could not see. All right? So, the point is, 
by great faith, Abraham concluded and believed that even when I sacrifice my son, my only son, God will raise him up from the dead. Now, how could he conclude that? Considering the fact there had been no precedent or example of anyone being raised from the dead before that. How can he conclude that? You see, again, verse 19 says, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. You see, faith says, even if I haven't seen it before, I know that God is able. Y'all ain't getting this. Even if I haven't seen it before, I know that God is able. Whether he chooses to or not, that's his business, but I know he's able. But notice, because of his faith in God's power to raise the dead, in his mind, because he says in a figurative sense he received them back from the dead, what does that mean? It means that in the mind of Abraham, Isaac was already sacrificed. As far as Abraham was concerned, when he lifted up the knife, his son was dead. Because he had every intention to kill his son until the angel from heaven said, stay your hand. So in Abraham's mind, he was already dead. So in a figurative sense, because he was already dead, God had raised him from the dead and gave him back to him. What in your life was dead that God has now brought back to life? Don't think too hard. Let me answer that for you. If you have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ by, by, by Jesus Christ by faith and obedience, it's you. It's you. So if God can save you who were once dead, what can he do? You see, with men, this is impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. I've said enough. You have to ask yourself, and I have to ask myself, do we just believe in God or do we truly believe God? You see, as I said in Sunday school this morning, whenever we reach something in our lives that we have no control over, that we are hemmed in and we see no way of escape, all we have to do is look back at our lives and see what God has already done. Stop doubting. Stop wondering if God can handle this. And just look back to what he's already done that you had the same sentiments toward. Amen, somebody. God is faithful to his word. And I've said enough. The question is, do you believe God? Especially if you're here today and you not obeyed the gospel. Do you believe God? Not just believe in him. Because like most of us, amen somebody, when we believed in God, we thought we were okay. We thought that that was good enough. Well, I believe in God. I'm not out here doing crazy stuff all like that. So I'm good, right? No, you're not. It's not about goodness. It's about being born new in the blood of Jesus Christ. You've heard the word. Do you believe it? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If you believe it, 
Are you willing to repent of your sins, turn from your way of life right now, and turn to God? And guess what? You can't do that without God. Stop trying to do it on your own. You can't. Confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then in obedience, be baptized. So our new sister in Christ on Monday, Jasmine, was baptized into Christ. Then just on Friday, Arvin, our brother in Christ, new brother in Christ, was baptized down in Columbus. Be buried in baptism for the forgiveness of your sin. You say, well, I've already been baptized. Well, my question to you is, what were you baptized unto? A man-made organization or the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ? There is a difference. And if you don't know the difference, we'll stand here and we'll help you look into the word of God so you can get an understanding for yourself. Amen, somebody. It matters. Not because we say, because God says. God does not recognize what he hasn't authorized. Is that all right? Consider where you are as we together stand and sing the words of encouragement.